Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you guys for being here at the first uh, the first quarter Texas GIS community meeting. Um, we are very excited that we're having it in our Barbara Jordan building here in Central Austin. So, um, yeah, those who are couldn't come in today, you're missing out on a very nice facility here. But uh, hopefully, this will make it in our rotation, depending on how this meeting goes. So. Uh, welcome everybody and glad that you could make it with us. For those of you, again, I always say this when we start these meetings, um, if you haven't been with us before, you're not familiar with what these meetings are about, um, this is about data sharing and information sharing between between all between the community. So what we try to do is, is provide information that TextGeo is doing that might be a benefit to you, um, but also too, um, we're very interested in learning about what y'all are doing and not include just not only what you're doing, but maybe what your data needs are and, and how you're using maybe our information. So um, we learn a lot from these meetings. Um, these are supposed to be uh, interactive as much as we can. I know we are doing it um, kind of a hybrid approach here, but feel free to put in your questions into chat. Uh, we'll do our best to monitor those and answer them as we can. Um, and also to, I believe we are recording this, is that correct? We are recording this too, so we will, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, you know, to get here or if you need to leave earlier or whatever, we will be posting um, this, this video as well. So uh, just give you a little bit of overview on what we are going to be working on, if I can advance my slide. There we go. Okay, so um, this is a picture of that of the brand new state buildings. If you haven't had a chance to see them, if you drive by or whatever, this is the Barbara Jordan building, and it's uh, just basically centrally located to our offices here at TextGeo. Um, beautiful location, and hopefully you can you can uh, join us in the future. Uh, I have to do this right. There's like eight buttons here. Okay. So our agenda looks like this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the GIO and NISHIC updates that we uh, that I'll be providing to you. Kind of some things that are going on there. I think you need uh, you know should be aware of and what we're doing. Uh, then uh, TextGeo is going to talk about our StratMap program and our updates. Um, we have a featured presentation, um, so we're very happy to have Stephanie and Mike here that are going to talk uh, a little bit about. Uh, I, I love this name, Mar marrying FME and ArcGIS. So we're very excited to hear about that. Then of course we'll go into our roll call, um, which is where we would love to hear from everybody uh, here um, and online. And then we'll have our closing remarks and then we are going to be going across the street. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how many people who were on this call actually make it to the, across the street, but did not quite make it to this meeting. And I have a feeling there'll be some of y'all. So um, just FYI, here we go. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the NISGIC updates. NISGIC is the National States Geographic Information Council. It is basically an organization that I am proud to say that I am the president of uh, at this time. And what it's really designed to do is to have all the state GIOs uh, from around the country get together and talk about basically what the issues are across the state. But the, the, the bigger idea is to is to work uniformly across states so that our data products and their data products are kind of jiving that we're using the same sort of technologies. We have a, a large uh, base of business partners that we work with that help us find our solutions that we that we kind of bring back uh, to Texas and many of our partners are, are in this room right now. Um, and so uh, what since, since I've become president, which, which was in the September timeframe, one of the things that uh, we did initially uh, in November, as I invited the presidents, uh, two of the presidents, one the president-elect and the past president, uh, to join me in Kansas, um, where we could uh, talk about a strategic plan for um, for the, for our organization. We did bring in a, an individual too, who is very very highly skilled in business development, uh, the the GIO of Illinois. Uh, we asked him to come down too, and we met for a few days. To lay out a strategic plan and a mission on, on how we're going to be how we're going to be working not only with our business partners what we need to do for the states but also to what we can do for our federal partners 
um, as well. So we're un- kind of uniting everybody at, at one level uh, to get all, all on the same page. And, uh, you know, frankly, we've been working really without a real strategic plan. And so we're very excited that uh, we're putting one together as we speak. Um, the other thing, too, that I did want to bring up is that we are working on our meteor conference, which is going to be at the end of March. Um, this meteor conference is, 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 is very, very similar where we just get everybody together, but we're doing something different this time. Uh, we are going to be meeting uh, many of our representatives uh, in D.C., um, to talk about who we are, what we're doing, and to see if there's any ideas that they may have uh, uh, in programs and projects that they are working on that could use our our insight to. We want to make them knowledgeable about who we are. And we want them to also know that when they are putting policy together, that we are the group they should be going to to get the ideas down so they don't run with an idea that's probably not of best practices or, or has some sort of, um, you know, something attached to it that is really not the way you should be building a, a, a program. Um, and so I'm very excited that uh, I have been approved to go and, and meet with some of our representatives and we're figuring out who those representatives are and, and where they're gonna be. And hopefully they'll be there at that time. And if they're not, many of them have said that, they, that they'll that they have people there for me to talk to. So. Uh, many of the state organizations are going to be meeting with their reps. And we're all going to be speaking the same language about uh, how valuable GIS technology is at the, at the national level, not just at the state level. So very happy about that. Um, we've established two new uh, committees uh, since I've taken over. One of them was, is called the Advocacy Committee. Even though we had, had kind of had an advocacy arm there, it wasn't really a formalized committee, but we made a a formalized effort of it. And basically what advocacy does is it looks at these best practice technologies and it, it and we work with others to, to basically drive those forward um, and say, this is the way things need to get done. This is the way uh, you, you need to do it across states, uh, across our, you know, with our federal partners as well. So advocacy and going to the Hill are kind of the same thing, right? I mean, you're, you're basically advocating to do something or, or to have something done a particular way. Uh, so we've got a, a, a committee established. We're very, very excited about that. Uh, the other one is, is, is something new, and this has kind of came up with when I was working with ACC, um, is accessibility. Um, you know, when you're in an organization like uh, like NISJIC, you know, you need to be thinking about accessibility and how that gets how that gets defined at the national level. And, and frankly, there's really been nothing much done on it. Um, I had mentioned that ACC had a, had a, had a really good program um, relating to accessibility. Um, the group thought it was a really good idea to start to kind of bring that into our normal conversations and try to understand more about what it does and how we can support uh, through our advocacy committee, um, these accessibility issues. So these are two brand new committees. Uh, they uh, advocacy is only met a couple of times, and accessibility is still being developed as we speak. So as these kind of uh, do more, I, I will definitely report that back. And then there's one other thing that I think is a really big deal is a new group that we founded called the National Geospatial Consortium. And basically, this is a brand new group. It's a very NISJIC like group, but it's a, we call it kind of like our sister agency. It's a 501c3. NISJIC is a 501c6. And so what, what, this, what the NGC allows us to do is to go after grants that we couldn't do under the uh, 501c6 umbrella. Um, so it gives us a lot more opportunity to take in funds, to take on grants, to take on um, donations, things like that, that help support GIS activities. And as a, uh, when I become the past president, which will be in September, I will become the president of NGS. So the past president automatically takes on the presidency of this new group. Um, so I'll be happy to, you know, to take that on, but we'll be marrying those two. Uh, they'll be working closely together. So any grants that we get through the NGC, Hopefully, NISJIC will be able to pick those up and spread them out to the states and and do you know those kinds of activities. So, um, extremely excited about um, where that's going. So again, I will definitely keep you guys posted. But right now, we're kind of building this foundation, 
um, to hope that it will bear fruit um, here in the, in the coming years. One other initiative I did want to bring up um, is uh, something that I'm, I'm just referring to right now as a school safety initiation uh, uh, an, an initiative. And what this basically is, uh, this kind of stems out of our, um, our digital twin ideas. And so uh, some of y'all probably heard us talk about digital twin as maybe being kind of that new paradigm shift in data. Um, specifically, uh, digital twin is really, really critical when we're working on NG911 type activities uh, to be able to bring in that 3D type of model so that NG911 can work very, very well with that kind of information. But as we were talking about that, we start talking about, you know, one of the low hanging fruit there would be school schools. Um, and so we have been working um, closely with some of our partners uh, to talk about how we can maybe derive a process using GIS data and GIS technology that allows high school students to map their own facilities um, as a curriculum in the program. And if you can do that, what can happen is, is you don't have to spend the, 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 the you know, costs on having a contractor come in and map, but at the same time, you're teaching kids on how to use GIS software and how to use GIS technology and ideas and, and that kind of thing. And so the hope is, is that we could get high school kids to map the schools. And then as they graduate out, the new kids come in, can edit and modify anything that's to be modified and then go in and start maybe mapping the middle schools that feed that high school and then go down all the way to the elementary schools and then start over as new people come through the program. Um, our conversations have been extremely beneficial. We've been talking to uh, Dell Valley um, high school, the superintendent over there seems very, very interested in developing a, a, a curriculum around that. We brought it up at the at the last uh, ACC uh, uh, ACC committee that 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 I chair, and it seems to have had some some really good thoughts to it uh, there. And the hope is is that maybe. The high school kids, as they get out, can get college credit for going through that program. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of see where this this is going. And I think it allows the kids to have their own ability to take school safety into their own hands, basically. It gives, gives them a purpose to do, you know, to do certain things. So we're very, very early in these conversations, um, but we're very, very excited about where it's going and how that uh, folks have been very, very interested in in being a part of it. So um, as we move forward, we will definitely kind of keep everybody apprised of that. Uh, we do want to have something on the books about how this might work for the next legislative session so we can go back and talk to the folks at the Capitol about the right way to map schools and it doesn't have to be crazy expensive as I think they're uh, thinking it's going to be. Um, so that's kind of really all I, I have to report on, on that side of it. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them into chat. I'm assuming we don't really have anything going on right now. And if anybody wants to learn more about it, just please uh, let me know. I'll be happy to talk more about what we're doing. So with that, I think I turn it over to Lauren. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Kirk. I'm the imagery specialist at TextGIO, and I'm happy to kick off um, our StratMap program updates, uh, with some updates regarding our imagery. So, oh, there's two slides. Wow. Okay, cool. Didn't know that. Um, <laughs> so, we're starting with our Texas Imagery Service, which is our annual subscription service um, for imagery, which is available to all Texas government entities and their contractors. Um, the Texas Imagery Service provides six inch natural color um, statewide imagery um, on an updated on an every other year cycle. And that imagery is available as WMS and WMTS links. Um, so our partners are with AppGeo and Hexagon and Sanborn to provide imagery content for the imagery service. Um, our latest recent uh, statewide collection for 2022-23 was published in November, um, so that's very exciting. And that collection joins a long list of about 20 other collections going back to 2011 that are um, accessible to for users of the program. 
Um, but for our upcoming collections, we're really, really excited to announce that we have a Central Texas urban area that is in acquisition now. Um, and that will be joining our planned uh, next statewide 24, 2025 acquisition, which we are in the very early planning stages of. So stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, this is just a preview of what the uh, kind of web interface looks like for the Texas Imagery Service. Um, it would look very similar uh, in your ArcGIS Pro or your QGIS or any geospatial software you use. Um, but you can see here that there are many layers of uh, imagery, various vintages that users can toggle into their maps to use for any projects or um, analyses that you guys have. Uh, just a quick status update. Again, we have full statewide for 2022-2023. And then I did mention at the top of the announcement that it is a uh, paid subscription service. And so we have different cost tiers depending on the size of your agency and your government entity. I do also want to point out that state universities count as a, as a Texas government entity. I know sometimes that is not always super clear. But if you have any questions regarding uh, costs for you and your, your agency, please feel free to shoot me an email and I can talk about that with you. Um, yeah. And if you are not a current user of the Texas Imagery Service and you would like to check it out, um, you can go to our main website, tnrs.org, and under our data and maps drop down is the Texas Imagery Service project page where uh, you can request a free two week trial link of the imagery service. Um, so please check out that project page if you can. There are a lot of really helpful FAQs on there as well. But I also do want to uh, give a shout out to our TextGIO data hub because on that website we have over 90 collections of ortho imagery, not including our historic imagery collections that are available for you to download or stream via WMTS links right now. So definitely check out both. Uh, they both are really robust services that offer a lot uh, for you and your agencies. And uh, my name is Lauren Kirk. My email will be at the end of this presentation, but please feel free to drop any questions in the Teams chat or to shoot me an email. And with that, I will hand it over to Ellen. Hi everybody, my name is Ellen St. Romain and I am the Elevation Specialist and I have some Elevation Program updates for y'all. So first and foremost, as you can see, our 2023 El Paso Fairport Brazos LiDAR collection is now live on the Data Hub. Um, so just as a quick refresher, this collection includes 4,680 DO4 Q tiles. It's mostly our standard QL2 LiDAR, DEMs, and hypsography. Um, with a few buy-up areas, uh, we partnered with Texas Parks and Wildlife on this project, so we have some buy-up areas over state parks. Active LIDAR acquisitions we have going on, we have two projects. So Archer, Jack, Lampasas, and Smith County's LIDAR has kicked off and is in acquisition mode. Um, this is a quick flight or LIDAR acquisition progress map that I got last week. It has actually been updated as of this morning. So all of Archer and Jack counties are now collected. Um, so that's 40% complete. And then our second active LIDAR project we have going on is in Hayes and Williamson's County here in Central Texas. So that acquisition has also kicked off since I created these slides and that acquisition is 60% complete. So we're well on our way to getting this LIDAR um, and yeah, both of those collections are estimated to be delivered at the end of this year. We also have one bathymetry project going on uh, around Houston and Corpus Christi area. So that data has been delivered to us. It is in-house and we're going through some in-house data processes uh, that will be available soon, still um, early this year. Uh, so this is a list of high priority bathymetry areas um, and we have crossed off quite a few. So if there's anybody out there who's interested in partnering with us on future bathymetry projects, these are the high priority areas that we're interested in collecting. Uh, we did just kick off this year's LIDAR, but we're already planning for next year's LIDAR. So uh, we're looking to collect some LIDAR over areas that were previously flown in 2016. 
So I will be reaching out to people in this area to see if they're interested in partnering with us. But if y'all know of anybody, please spread the word. We're always looking for partners, um, not only for LIDAR, but all elevation data sets. So um, again, my name is Ellen St. Romain, and that's my contact right there. And do you have any questions for me? Okay. I'm going to hand it off to Clayton to give you an update on the LPA team in progress. Hey, everyone. I'm Clayton Rainier, and I am the Geographic Data Officer for TextGIO. Um, I took over the Land Parcel Address Point program from more this past year, so I'm just going to give a brief update on the status of that. Um, the 2024 collection has started as of this month. Uh, that data is anticipated to be available in July of 2024. Goals for this collection are to improve coverage and fill gaps, and then to improve uh, the efficiency of our ETL process using FME. Um, we're still waiting on results from the 2023 address points that were submitted to the National Address Database back in October. Um, there were over 10 million records that were submitted. So yeah, just pending the results on that. And then you can visit the TextGIO Data Hub for access to uh, all the previous years, my parcel and address point data, and the web map service links for those. That's all I have. I'll go ahead and pass it off to Maria. Howdy folks, I'm Maria, the GIS Specialist for our Research and Distribution Center. Um, do you have a few updates we're excited to share? Yeah, speak up a little louder, sorry. Okay, is Thank this you. better? Yeah, yeah. All right. awesome. Thank you. I uh, do have a few updates to share, starting with the data warehouse now being linked uh, through the S3 bucket key within the Data Hub Historical Collections. Uh, that will be under the Metadata tab scroll down a bit and this link will take you to our uh, data warehouse that you see over here on the left. If you are wanting to get that link, feel free to take a speech, take a picture of this QR code. We'll send you right over. Next, uh, going on to our georeferencing project that is continuing into the 2024 year. The Goal of this project is to have 100,000 frames georeferenced. This project will include historical aerial imagery collections unique to text GIO, urban and metropolitan areas uh, will be priority. Uh, please email Aaron or myself if you have any questions. And finally, our US Army Corps of Engineer collection is being integrated integrated into archive. This is physical and a digital collection um, that was donated to us that spans from 1957 to 2011. It is partially georeferenced, and we're finding that the areas of interest were coastal and water resources. Don't be shy. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. We are always happy to help and serve our community, which is y'all. And here's our contact info. And I'll hand it off to Kayla to introduce our featured presentation. Any questions for any of the StratMap team at Texas Geographic Information Office? All right. We can do. We're, we're ahead of schedule. Uh, so we got a question. Will there be a project to georeference the rest of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer data? Um, a lot of that will likely depend on where exactly that data resides. So, you know, for some of the coastal regions, you know, georeferencing that stuff is very challenging. Um, but for the most part, if it if it's possible to be georeferenced, we will probably eventually get to it um, along with the other images in the historical archive. Uh, Lauren, there's a question about the NOAA CCAP. There's an update on that. 
we are still <laughs> waiting on the delivery for the NOAA CCAP data. Um, any day now. <laughs> as soon as we have it, it will be on Data Hub and announcement will go out. So we are eagerly awaiting this event. Okay. okay, we'll move on to our featured speakers. So I'm very happy to introduce Stephanie and Mike Long. I've known Stephanie and Mike um, since before they were married, <laughs> long time ago, so long time friends. So I'm so happy that you guys are here to speak with us. They had actually requested to give this presentation at the Texas GIS Forum that we just had um, last October. And at that point, we were already full in our speaker slots. And so when we were looking at who we would uh, potentially have for a future speaker for this community, first quarter community meeting, um, we immediately thought of Stephanie and Mike because we know that they will be good presenters. And also their topic we know will be um, very appealing to uh, a lot of people. So um, without further ado, Stephanie Long is the Associate Dean of the brand new Faculty Center for Learning Innovation at the Austin Community College. And Mike Long, or Michael Long, is the Geospatial Technologies Program Manager at Capital Metro. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie and Mike. All right, thanks y'all. Um, so we are here today to share our experience with automating GIS workflows. And our title kind of came from our own experience in our careers. So uh, a while back, I was the only GIS person at a very small company and there was a lot of work to be done and I couldn't do it all in the time that everyone wanted it to be done. So I learned automation through Python and Model Builder. And over the years, I have learned about FME and what FME can do. And so marrying your automation techniques that you already have with Model Builder or Python with FME is really a, a way to have a healthy relationship with your GIS workflow on a day to day basis. Uh, and so uh, my husband, Mike Long, is here. He's the FME expert. He's professionally certified in FME. Uh, and then at Austin Community College, we teach the data interoperability extension, FME and automation techniques like Python and Model Builder in our classes. As you figured out, we're married. Really, I'm just here for the pun <laughs> so that she can have her joke. <laughs> so automation, how many of you are automating some type of workflow at work already? OK, good. What are you utilizing? What are your tools and techniques? Python. Python? Sure. Anybody else? Yes. I saw some hands here. Model Builder. Model Builder. You use FME too? Great. Very cool. So for those of you that didn't raise your hand, we are hopefully going to encourage you today to start thinking about automating or touching on automation. We have a um, open educational resource that we're gonna share with you. It's a website that we've curated that gets you started with FME and integrating FME with ArcGIS through the data interoperability extension. So if you wanna get your toes wet, you've got something to play around with there. So this is the FME Workbench interface. It is a standalone application. So if you're in ArcGIS Pro and you go to the analysis ribbon and you click on the data interoperability extension, it opens a new software and that is FME. And that's what this interface is here. It may look familiar. There is a workspace area, the canvas, which is where you place all of the activity that's happening in your automation workflow. Um, and we're gonna have a screenshot here of Model Builder and compare those two to give you an idea. It has a translation log at the bottom that gives you some insights into what's running on the background. And then over on the left side, you can navigate through some different tools and techniques that you can add to your canvas. There are um, a lot of tools, like how many thousands? Um, transformers, so they call them transformers. Uh, that's part of the whole ETL thing that we'll kind of cover here in a minute. Um, there's 800 transformers, I think, and, it, and I think about this time they're re able to read around 500 different data formats, read and write 500 different data formats. 
Um, I want to touch on something that Stephanie said. She mentioned data interoperability extension. That is Esri licensing, licensing FME from Safe Software, who is who makes FME. It's a way for you to be able to purchase FME through Esri. It is kind of a slimmed down version, or at least it used to be. Um, that way, if you maybe have licensing from Esri, it might be easier for you to get FME through that route than having to go through another vendor. So there's options there if you need them. So in an FME workbench, you're, you'll, I think you'll have some comfort if you've worked with Model Builder before or if you've worked with Python. It's kind of the same format where you have your input requirements, your input parameters, and then the tool in its settings, and then your output that gets created. Uh, so this is an example of a sheet that gets loaded in through a reader. The reader allows FME to understand the contents of that sheet. And then the transformer is where you perform your actions. So it's similar to like a geoprocessing tool. Similar, not the same. Uh, it allows you to bring in that input, do something with that input, and generate your output. In this case, it's looking for coordinates, and it's going to take those coordinates and convert them into a point that will be on your map as your output. Kind of touched on this idea of ETL a little bit. We might go into it a little bit more in another slide, but this is a great spot. This here is the reader. That stands is the extract portion of ETL. Transformer. They didn't really give a new name for that. So that's the transform portion of ETL. And then Safe calls it a writer. So that's the load portion of ETL. You'll hear ETL a lot, both through our conversation today and just in general. ETL has been around for a very long time. Uh, so this is a comparison between Model Builder and an FME workbench. If you're used to Model Builder, you're familiar with. Um, the geoprocessing tools being kind of a yellow rectangle, your inputs being in a blue oval and your outputs being in a green oval. You're used to dragging things over and dropping them into your workspace. You can do that in FME as well. If you group a part of your workflow into a group, that bookmark is something that's available in FME as well. So if you compare these two workflows, they look kind of similar, right? Our workflow is starting on the left and it's working its way towards the right. Uh, it's starting with inputs and ending with outputs. There's some tools and transformations that are happening in between. Uh, but you'll notice some differences. The lines in Model Builder are, are arrows. In FME, they are there are lines that connect as well, but you'll notice numbers on those lines. So FME will actually dynamically show you how many features are running through that process at that stage in time. So those numbers, and we've got a video we'll show you here in a minute are just spinning and showing you how many features are making their way through the workflow, which is really nice. In Model Builder, you have the red, right? So everything turns red whenever it's running, and you've got the messaging window that you can see what's happening. Um, but within FME, it actually gives you a count, which is nice. Yeah, the other thing you get on all the transformers, you'll notice the green magnifying glasses. So that's the data as it looks at that point through the transformation. It's really handy when you're done developing a new one because you can inspect the data and what it's done through the process. Model Builder kind of does that. You have to add, right click and say add to display and you can add it in the map, you can view it. But since FME is its own standalone product, you can do it right within the application. You don't have to add it to a map right now. My turn. <laughs> <laughs> You made this presentation. So. <laughs> uh, so in FME, you have access to a lot of spatial extract, transform, and load tools. Just like in Pro, when you're working with Model Builder, you have hundreds of geoprocessing tools. Uh, so you can bring those different tools in and different transformers in. But there's also some similarity as far as the parameter settings go. So the parameters of the transformer, are some of them are going to look familiar. And what's nice is once you've created a workbench, if you're sharing this with a colleague who doesn't know FME and can't run the workbench, you can create a spatial ETL tool and they can just access that spatial ETL tool in the catalog pane and open it up and run it as long as those parameters are set correctly. Uh, this is an example. Every once in a while, you'll find something that you're trying to do in FME that you just simply can't get the software to do in the way that ArcGIS wants it to be. Luckily, SAFE has this thing called, a, what are they calling it here, Python Caller. There's two, there's Python Creator and Python Caller. Uh, they work in essentially the same way. Python Creator or Python Caller is what you use in the middle of a transformation. 
this example is one that I created where when I was using the aggregator, which is kind of like the dissolver in, in FME, and I was trying to write that data to AGO, AGO didn't like it. It's just because of the way FME is kind of storing the data differently than the way Esri is expected. So by writing this data out to a file geo database, importing ArcPy, and then calling the dissolve tool, I was able to then read the data back in and send it into HBO. So the example is, if you can't do it in FME, almost always you can figure out a way to do it with Python. And so that's one of the really nice advantages of FME, is that you've got some different features in there that make it so that if their software can't do it yet, you can get around that with Python or with SQL or things like that. So this is the interface of the data operability data interoperability extension. I could never say that correct. Data interop. Data interop. Data I <laughs> of the FME interface. And we've got a workbench here that has a workflow that I think many of you have probably done before. So you've gone out to the data hub, you've accessed the imagery layer that you're looking to bring in, you have found the tiles that you need that cover your study area. You've downloaded the tiles, brought them into your project, mosaic them together. Now you've got some imagery. Uh, FME will do all that for you. So stop doing that manually. Let FME do it. <laughs> FME will go to the website. It will take your study area shape file. It will overlay it with the tile index for that imagery. It will find the tiles that it needs for your study area, download them, and, and bring them into your, your uh, project folder. So that's what this workbench is doing. We've got two different workflows, the top and bottom. They're the same, but just for different years of imagery. It's going out. So the kind of light pink that you see there is, is the study area. The kind of orange rectangles you see are the tile index polygons. It's finding the tiles that it needs and downloading just those tiles and bringing those down. And uh, this is an example of this study area, which is the intersection of Mopac and Slaughter, West Slaughter Lane. They have changed that intersection to be one of those strange things where you go across the road. Uh, so you can see that change taking place there in the imagery. So FME, automating your workflows, something like that, your data acquisition, your data assimilation, workflows, let FME do it for you. Don't go to the website and manually click. <laughs> Saves a lot of time and it's nice. So the workbench will show you how many tiles are running through, how many failed, how many passed, how many you're gonna have as a result. And then, like Mike mentioned, you can click on the green little magnifying glass, and that's going to show you a preview of the data. So that's literally what we're seeing here in the bottom right with those orange rectangles. It's showing us the tile index layer that it found and is using, and it's showing us the study area shapefile. You know, you can visually inspect that and make sure you've got the right data running through the workbench, which is nice. And you can also open the attributes as well, and uh, as you can see in the top right here. Uh, so this is a little video. Let's see if it Friends works. Request access. Okay, okay. go ahead. Let's do it. We're signed in as Tinderous user. I'm not going to put a message. You know who I am. I can just go ahead in the presentation. We can come back. Oh, yeah, we're done. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. Sorry, we're done. <laughs> no, there's <laughs> one of these that has a case. So turn that on. Well, you know, while you're figuring out, I can answer questions. Any okay. questions in the room or online? Mm -hmm. Not seen. Mm -hmm. Nothing online. We got one back there. Um, could you give some examples of what you're using FME for at Cap Metro? Oh, my goodness. Perfect timing. <laughs> That's what this is. Oh, my That's goodness. <laughs> Um, I use FME for a lot. Uh, I have hundreds of workbenches that I've created over the years. Uh, that's how I became to the point where I was able to get certified. I have, for the almost nine years I've been there, been the only full-time GIS professional there. So I had to learn to automate practically everything that I do. This is a great example. This is one of the more complex ones that I've made it over the years. I've been working on it slowly over many years, just slowly adding a little bit more. Um, it takes a series of text files and it combines them all together. This is the GTFS data, which is an open source data set that we use to put out our transit schedule. 
So it's putting all that together, got some Python in it, it's reading some geodatabases, it's pulling data from Oracle, it's pulling data from SQL Server, uh, text files, as I mentioned, and putting it all together and then writing it out to an enterprise geodatabase. Um, and then this section, section here is a new section that I added on uh, that's taking the results, reading it back out of the geodatabase, you know, figuring out the overlapping line segments and doing a bunch of calculations. And then here it's actually writing it up into our GIS portal, which is ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, so as you can see in this one workbench, I'm reading text. I'm reading from our enterprise geodatabase, which is Arcus DE. Um, Shapefiles, I think, Oracle. It's running some Python. The reason it's running Python is it actually figures out the begin date and the end date of our, of our schedule and calculates the days in between. It also calculates if the data was loaded because sometimes I get a new one and I have to run it back through. So it'll say, okay, well, there's data here. I'm actually going to loop through with Python and delete all the data for you. Um, it cleans it all up. Um, it basically does it all. I just pointed at the zip file. It actually reads the zip file and it extracts it and puts it all into a temp file, reads all the, the temp files, and loads it all into SD and, and RG, uh, RGS not online. Portal? GIS portal, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a great example. I literally just helped somebody yesterday read data out of Airtable. I don't know if you've heard of Airtable. It's apparently it's a new product, which is kind of taking off at Cat Metro. A number of people like it. Um, we're starting to get into using it with Snowflake. AGO is a great example. Uh, I've been playing with it lately between two different uh, REST endpoints, ServiceNow and Atlassian, Jira, and using it to trade data back and forth by uh, sending JSON commands between the two. Um, Naturally, all of the Esri, because the Esri and Safe have worked together for many years, and so almost all of the Esri formats, enterprise SDE, shapefile, file geodatabase. Uh, recently, what is that new mobile geodatabase? Um, almost, I, I don't think that they're it. If they have, if Esri has any new ones, Safe usually comes out with how to deal with it pretty quick within a release or two. Uh, that's the other nice thing about SAFE is they're usually really fast. They really only have three products, FME Server, FME Desktop, and FME Cloud. Uh, they recently rebranded. It's now called FME Form. So Desktop is FME Form. FME Flow is Server. And I think they're still calling it Cloud. I'm not so sure <laughs> on that. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, there's one. In the chat, so Anthony asks, how well does FME handle large data? It handles it really well, honestly. Um, did you get the video going? Yes. Yeah, so the video that Stephanie has, I'll let you get it from that, shows it reading um, a couple hundred thousand records in, in seconds. Uh, so they've, they've been working really hard to get it faster at reading data in. The other thing that works really well. As I mentioned that there's a Python caller, but there's also a SQL executor. So you can write your SQL inside there. That way you're sending the query to the database. Uh, and that works with you know, SQL, Oracle, Snowflake, a lot of the cloud databases. And that way you're able to deal with the, the big data sets at the database level and not at the client level. I don't know how well you guys can see it. It's kind of small, but you can see that we're already up to almost half a million records reading in. Uh, the thing to remember, though, that this is actually reading the data into your client. So wherever FME desktop is installed, or if FME server is, is running it, then it's running it at that server level. Uh, the more that you can make the processing happen at the database level by using the SQL executor, the better. But if you can't, FME can do it too. Uh, so in this particular example, you know, I don't know what you're doing here already. <laughs> yeah, so this workbench is looking at building footprints from two different years, and it's detecting any changes that have occurred between those years. So it's comparing the footprint polygons in two separate layers to each other. And so we've already processed, what, almost 600,000 building footprints, and some of them have made it through as a change, and some of them are not a change. And so it detects how many have changed, and it lets you know where those changes are. 
So here at the end, there's going to be a visual preview where you can kind of zoom in to the different building footprints that have been identified as changed. And so it's going through that change detection process. The attribute table there is showing us that we have five building footprints that have changed. So we can open the visual inspection for the two building footprint layers and where those changes are. And it's going to highlight where the changes are. So you've got your attribute preview here and then your geometry preview here. We've got some changes there in the, um, an old house that had a bunch of like uh, storage sheds and barns and things is gone and it's now a commercial building, I believe. And so those are the changes that it detected based on those building footprints across those two different data sets. And in the visual inspector for the geometry, you can zoom to that selection you can zoom out to your entire data set and kind of pan and manipulate that preview. So to, to kind of elaborate on what Steph said and, and go back with said Anthony mm -hmm. um, with the big data portion so there a trick here is we showed that that magnifying glass uh, the green box that's what's called feature caching I might be wrong or data caching in this case where Stephanie did this video she had that data caching turned off that speeds things up tremendously because it's not trying to cache that data for you to inspect uh, the other thing that is good about this particular workbench is she used the change detector to figure out what had actually changed and sent that out to the different writers. That means you're keeping most of your processing in memory and you're not sending a whole lot of edits back to the database. It's only what changed, what it was inserted, updated, or, or deleted. Anything that didn't change just gets lost in the translation. So that speeds up tremendously for big data processing. Um, but we move at least easily a million records, half a million to a million records every night on FME server. Happens while we're all asleep. We don't even notice it. Any more slides? Okay. Is it? Oh, I think there's more. I think more, unless it's stuck on me. I have to click outside. The it's going again. Everybody has to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Not that thrilling. Oh, okay. um, so we curated a website for you. Uh, this website is the uh, end of our scripting class. Whenever I teach the scripting class at Austin Community College, we end with FME. So we learn about Model Builder and Python and tasks, and then we end with the fun stuff, which I think FME is fun. I've been learning like that. Uh, so these are about three to four weeks of our course content we've made as an open educational resource available to the public for free. It is meant to help you get started with FME. And so there are three different topics. Introduction to ETL. What does ETL stand for? Extract, transform, load. Oh, everybody gets an A. All right. <laughs> and then advanced ETL and custom ETL. And so it gradually gets more difficult. But you have everything you need here except for your licensing to get started with FME. There's three topics. They step you through with slides and readings, and there's a quiz you can take to see if you're catching on to the nomenclature and terminology. And then at the end, there's a project for you to step through if you want to. It's a transit equity assessment project. I wonder where I got the transit idea from. No idea. No. <laughs> um, but it looks at Project Connect, which we all approved as a city, and the different routes of Project Connect and how their stops and routes are or are not equitable. So it steps you through creating Z scores or equity scores for the different stops and lines. Uh, so if you want to get in there and play around with that and build that workbench, it's really fun. It, it takes, I say it's fun. The nerd in me thinks it's fun. <laughs> you know, census data, does everybody love working with census data and all the tables and all the names and all the numbers? There's a workbench in here in that project that will do it all for you. So remove that as a headache that you have. If you have to work with census data, Get in there, take a look at that project. It's really nice. I can't take credit for it. I stole it from him. Stole so plugged it, it in. <laughs> and transformed it into a class project, yeah. not a business project. Um, and so it's got three different pages for each of those, and then uh, a tab across the top that also shows you the project. And then we just wanted to make sure and mention, if you're looking to experiment with this, but maybe work doesn't approve of it, or it doesn't directly relate to your work, um, Esri does have an ArcGIS for home use license that you can get, and FME it has with a, data interop. Uh, so, if you want to get the ArcGIS for home use you, and use data interop, you can get to it that way. Yeah, 
And then FME has a home use license as well. You used to be able to just go to their website, but now you have to contact them and request it, but it is still there. It's on their website. So I actually contacted them, tried to find out what was going on. Um, it's on their website. You fill out a form and then they want to communicate with you. They told me they did that because they had a lot of people abusing the free license. No. <laughs> you know, Esri's license costs a hundred bucks. So that probably slows it down. FME's is free and it still is free. They just want to make sure that you're not using it for actual work stuff and that you're using it for learning or community kind of stuff. Right. So the data interoperability is an extension. It's extra built on top of Pro, but for the home use, hundred dollars is that it per year? Yeah. Okay. Then you get it for that. Is that it? I think that's it. Yeah. That's it. So we have these slides. We've given it to um, Gayla and her team. So if anyone wants access to the slides, it's got the links to everything. Um, or you can email either one of us. Reach out to us, and we're, we're happy on to LinkedIn. share. Yeah, connect with us on LinkedIn. We're happy to share and talk to you about. It. Any other questions? Okay. Now, quick, quick question. If, um, so does FME, how does it handle when it encounters an error as it's processing? Is it pretty good about just ignoring it and letting you know which items it failed at? Not by default. Okay, so you have to kind of set up that error routine? There, There's a, a setting by default on error. It's set for terminate translation. Okay. Um, you can change that. It's just a drop-down setting. Uh, See if I can. Over on the far left, uh, in this navigator pane, you have the translation option. Uh -huh. We expand that down. There's a terminate option, and you can tell it to continue. When you're developing, I usually have it on continue, and a lot of the work that uh, transformers will have an error or rejected or some sort of thing that tells you that some of the stuff went out that direction. Uh, I find that when I'm dealing with date time, I almost always end up with everything going out rejected, and I have to then figure out why. Um, but some data is just bad, and it's going to end up being rejected, and you need to handle it a different way. The reason that the default is terminate is because I think they're just kind of assuming that that's what you want, and you could turn it off. You could turn it off and then put a terminator transformer there at the rejected to make it fail if you want. And you know, it might be that I actually had somebody at work do this a while back. 99% of the time, it was fine. Their process would run just fine at night. Every once in a while, they'd get a new feature that it wouldn't handle. And so they stuck it at the terminator, they actually sent it through an emailer, to email them what it was, and then terminate. And then that way, we, we, it wouldn't continue to try and handle that data. Um, and so there, there's a lot of flexibility in how you do it. Um, sometimes transformers don't terminate the way you expect. They don't error. Uh, we had this when we were dealing with an HTTP caller, and we were having it go out and getting some data, and it would get back a 404 error. And we said, why doesn't this error? And SAFE said, well, that's because that may be what you want. If a 404 is not what you want, then you need to put a terminator there and, and handle that differently. Uh, their example was, in some cases, the 404 means the page is missing, and then it wants to go on and put a new page there. So you may be looking for that to create some behavior. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you handle it. Uh, you just need to make sure that you are putting those, like when you're deep, you're developing some Python scripts. You got to put in the error trapping yourself. A lot of times, FME is the same way. And are you also allowed to? I mean, for example, in the in the example you're showing here, you've got hundreds of thousands of records. <laughs> is it possible to step through the first few of them to make sure it's everything's running okay and see what's happening? Like, look into the data at each step to go, okay, that's doing what I'm yeah, making you, it to do. You can. Um, so we talked about the the magnifying glass. Uh, being there, those green magnifying glasses, if you click on it, you're seeing that data. Okay. Um, what I find though, sometimes, you know, back to Anthony's big data, kind of what you're talking about with this example, sometimes your data is you should have a lot of it and you're waiting for it to transform. You can either put a where clause, if you're reading out of a database, the feature reader has a where clause option, so you can say where top 100, and you can just deal with 100. 
and that could be for your developing. Some of the data sets don't do that, like Excel, but it doesn't have a where cause capability. So you could send it through a sampler and say, just send the first 100 through and I'll deal with those in the rest of my, tra my transformation developing and then you just take the sampler out. What's really nice that we didn't mention, uh, can you go to the one of the other screenshots? Actually, no, this one's fine. Okay. <laughs> if you were to take something out of your workflow, let, let's say I grabbed that bottom vertex creator and just pulled it out, it reconnects the workflow to itself. Unlike in Model Builder where it breaks everything and you've got to go in and connect everything back again. So that part's really nice. You can drag it out. You can drag a new tool in and just drop it on that line that's connecting and it'll pop it in and make it part of the workflow. So it's pretty dynamic in modifying the workflow. He was saying you would just take that sampler out, which, you know, with Model Builder, that sounds very complicated. But in here, you just pull it out and it reconnects again. So it's, it's really dynamic and <laughs> for those changes that you might have. And you can even leave it in. I have some where I know I have to go back in and test pretty regularly. So the sampler is a great example of this. I'll leave the sampler in, but I'll just move it off to the side and disable it and then put a new connector there. And now it's bypassing that branch completely. Uh, so in the case of Steph's example with the vertex creator, you can just disable it and then connect from unique to your writer and then it doesn't try and create the, the vertices. Question? Yes, uh, when when you work with iterators, I find the first couple of times to be difficult. Do you have any rule of thumb of how to make them work the first time? What was the word? With yeah. iterators. Iterators. When, when they iterators. need to go through different loops. Um, because loops are a funny thing in FME. Yeah, I'll be honest. I actually don't do the looping very often. Uh, you're talking about bait where you can make a while loop? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what he's talking about is if you wanted to go and do an example of where I do this, I think it's the Socrata, the Austin um, open data portal. They have some data that I want to get, and it's you know a few hundred thousand records, but you can only get a thousand at a time. So you can send a while loop and you can iterate over it until it gets all of the data. I don't do it often enough, enough that I feel like I'm comfortable enough to really talk about it. I feel like whenever I'm building it, it sounds like you feel this way too. Yeah. You're kind of fumbling your way through until it works, and then you're okay, good, don't touch that. It works <laughs> okay. now. Yeah. Um, most of the time, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do iterators. Safe does a good job of having lots of articles, and you can go through there. They usually even have sample workbenches that you can download and figure out and and refresh yourself and, and figure out how to do something. But luckily, it's not something that you have to do very often a while loop with inside of me. I don't know if I fully answered your question now. <laughs> well, I, I, I just say that I'm on the same boat. So yeah. I, I don't feel like I'm uh, uh, playing so far. Yeah. I feel, I feel, I feel better with okay, you. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> Y'all can commiserate together. Yeah. Good question. In the job that you do, uh, for Cap Metro, how does it affect the transit system? How does FME or my job? The, the job that you do, how does it affect the transit system? So I don't really, I'm not really on the front lines with Cap Metro, so to speak. I'm assisting the people that are. So I, I assist the planners who use our GIS. I assist the demand response who uses our GIS. Um, Operations Control Center, you know, there's many, many, many departments. Operation Control Center. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, I'm a realist here. I use the MLK crossing uh, there where the, the rail goes through, mm -hmm. and the crossing arms are never timed like they should. Okay. Does your program or somebody's program affect the way those crossing, crossing arms go down and up? My program, no. 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 <laughs> Well, uh, but if you, you want, we can discuss after this. It's a complaint. Okay. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I'm sitting there and there's no train. Right. And those crossing arms are down. I see the train, it comes by, and it's a quarter mile down the road and they finally go up. Okay. I see, you know, it, right. it's hurting the traffic flow, their actual traffic flow that goes through those intersections. Not only there, but I know the one on by the Fiesta Market, you know, the traffic just backs up. Because those crossing arms are not timed right. right. Now, if you were to go to San Diego and look at the trolley system, as soon as a rear end, I could use a different word, 
of the rear end of that trolley crosses and is going the other way, those things go up, I mean, like within five seconds. Right. right. Over here, you sit there for a minute. You yeah, know Mike, I mean? Mike can't be blamed for that. Even no, no, what I'm not. <laughs> but pass that along to somebody. Okay, if you want after this. I mean, I look for a phone number one time. Yeah. And there's no phone right. number, no email, no nothing about trying to send a suggestion. Okay, right. that's, that's a me after suggestion. But yeah, that's that's it. Okay. Any other questions? Do you feel better? I actually, I feel <laughs> <something about. laughs> no, because he didn't, he's not going to lift the book. He didn't solve his problem, but. I know. I didn't solve the other guy's problem either. So. <laughs> I got one over here, one over here. It's correct. So 50 50. Right. <laughs> what, what about mine? I can't do yours. So. Yeah, we need a tiebreaker. Yeah. <laughs> one more question. I mean, I had one back there. So, yeah, I'm three out of five. I have a question for Stephanie. Yeah. Can you tell us? I know this is off topic. Can you tell us just a little bit about the new innovation learning institute that you are putting together? Oh, at ACC? Yeah. Oh, okay. So ACC has opened a new um, area they call the Faculty Center for Learning Innovation, and it's meant to build a network of faculty to work together on ways they can innovate in the classroom. Um, so I'm traveling to every single campus, meeting with faculty, helping them out with new innovative ideas they have for what they want to do in the classes that they're teaching at ACC. ACC is an amazing college, y'all. I don't know if you've looked into it recently. I know we've got some alumni here that can speak to it. Um, but they do amazing things. We have four bachelor's degrees now. We're not just associate's degrees and certificates. Um, so if you have kids that are getting close to college age, um, you might have them look at ACC. And our chancellor recently announced, I don't know if you saw in the news, we are hoping to pay tuition for all graduating high school students in the Austin area for the fall of 24. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. Woo <laughs> All right, any other questions on or off topic? <laughs> All right, well, if you don't have any questions as you're going through that website, if you want to step through the materials or just in your own workflows, you can contact either one of us. We're happy to help out. Um, he's more knowledgeable than I am, but if, if you want to learn it from the bottom up, then I'm your go. <laughs> I never hear that. My wife would never say he's more Your wife would never than say they're yeah. husband. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks, y'all. Can you come up for our next segment? Yeah, you have to say, my son is a proud uh, river bat. Yay, yes. go river bat. Yes. Yeah. I brag about ACC all the time, not just because of the money I'm saving, but because uh, it is a if, if I had a chance to do it over again, I think I would be a river. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Stephanie and Mike. Uh, very, very good stuff. I know FME is, uh, you know, it's been around for a while, but man, it's really, it's really doing, you know, good stuff. And I know that we've kind of gotten back on that bandwagon ourselves. So, um, oh. okay. So this is. This is the part I like that I enjoy the most. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping uh, kind of have a small crowd this time and hoping the folks on online can can contribute to this. But uh, we've told you everything that we're doing. And now we'd like to hear a little bit more about what you guys are doing. Um, and again, it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, a project or but if you're if you need something um, or if you're looking for you know, an idea or whatever. I mean, just whatever you have, this is where we really, really uh, like to learn more about what y'all are doing because it helps us define how we create information and data and how we can help. So um, so with that, does anybody in the in the group here want to go first with maybe some some ideas of what, what y'all are working on? Uh, huh, let me think. Let me think oh. who I could pick on. Oh, hey, oh, Scott. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, ran into Richard at lunch and he bribed me and said, <laughs> I mean, here, I, was, I, I had conflicting meetings. I said, oh, it's today. It's not on my calendar. I, but I made him feel it. bad and he's here. <laughs> guilted, guilted me into it. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Scott Friedman, uh, director of the geospatial team at uh, the General Land Office. And in addition to our, I'll keep it brief, but in addition to our very important uh, work, ongoing work, supporting our energy resources program. These guys can speak much more eloquently than I can about um, 
brings in millions and millions of dollars every year for the permanent school fund. So that's our main revenue producing billions, billions excuse me, uh, for, for the school, school children of Texas, very important. Uh, but in addition to that, our oil spill prevention and response program, coastal resources, coastal field operations, um, the adopt beach program, we have that. So, uh, anyway, we support all that with our, with our GIS work. Um, we, I was going to just highlight, we're, um, we're working on a plan. We're approaching the end of the PSF portion of the Regen project, very generously funded uh, through uh, through Texas GIO, through the Strat Map program. Um, so we're talking internally about best approaches for, and I want to meet with you guys about best approaches for posting, getting it out there in the very near future. We want to do um, at least the, P the the redone PSF. This is don't worry, it's not to conflict with anything we do in China, but a, a, a redone um, state land grid uh, based on the freely available Railroad Commission data, but but then augmented, updated, and then certainly adding the GLO attributes uh, to that. So it's going to be another resource. Um, so in addition to that, we are we are also getting very close to um, completing our. We're doing a data hub, so we're going to be moving our custodial data layers to a data hub, um, thanks to the great model and uh, by, by TextGIO and a lot of other agencies. Um, but we're going to be going through a, uh, a short period of testing and then uh, by some trusted users and then um, to get it out there. Uh, and then we're working with other groups in IT uh, to talk about future, uh, future state app posting, uh, cold fusion upgrades and, and migration things like that, just kind of getting rid of some old legacy stuff and up updating um, updating systems and servers, things like that. Um, I think that's about it, unless anybody had questions. Oh, the other thing we want, one of the other things we want to meet with y'all about is getting the rest of our historical aerial imagery posted on, on y'all's data hub. Um, yeah. That's kind of yeah. a, yeah. I guess, lagging thing that we would like to finally do this year, kind of a goal. Yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we, now that we have the data warehouse. Yeah, I know, you know yeah. it's, it'll be pretty easy to integrate it. So, yeah, if you, that's fantastic. Yeah, so let's, you know, in the near future, let's set up a meeting. You know, would that be you, the point person? Oh, no. no? okay. Okay. Send you an email. Great. Thank you, sir. Yes. So the big back to the infamous Scott Breeden. Oh, did y'all know that he was a an actor? Yes, we do. Is everybody? Y'all need to go Thanks. see one of his shows. Uh -huh. Pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <Yes. laughs> Promoter over here. Yeah. I get a big fee. I do have a show coming up in a couple of weeks. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> do tell. It's time. Uh, I don't and, find and, it. and he doesn't use foul language. In the show, I mean, not in not in this show. I know. He's not talking like a Brit. Sing, no, not that anyone would want to hear. <laughs> anyway, as a feedback to what Scott was saying, and, and how you know, they really post our department really. I mean, to the team. I mean, they support us. I mean, to no end. Uh, the one kudo that I want to bring up is the land parcels. Land parcel parcel data that I'm not sure when it got served up. It's been Years ago, maybe. I'm not sure. Talk about the private ownership part. Yeah, 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 yeah. It has been a game changer to 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 what uh, Ruben and I do as far as accurately depicting a lot of the lease documents that we, you know, have oversight of to make sure everything is showing up correctly. You know, we're we're going back daily. You know, we we put in new stuff to make sure that it falls in line. But then, if we have some stuff that's been in there for ten years when we didn't have parcel data. We go back in and redo a lot of that stuff based on parcel data, which, which matches up really well with imagery and, and that type of stuff. So, really, it's been a, a big help and assistance to us to, to make sure that things look really well when it's out there on the public server. And uh, you know, we, we manage, you know, the number is 13 and a half million acres uh, of state properties that uh, we have oversight over. So, uh, any help we can get to. Have that available to us to assist in what we do. 
Okay. Well, we appreciate that. And, and we knew that um, land parcel data was probably one of the most sought after data sets. I mean, you know, Scott and I have talked about it for years and years. And I mean, it's kind of kind of taken an effort. But one thing I did want to I kind of want to reiterate to the group here and those those that are online is that, um, you know, we from a text geo perspective, we work on things that are state based uh, best we can. So just because you're looking for something that is county based does not necessarily mean uh, it's it's something we can't do. So, for example, um, aggregating a lot of information together at, at a statewide level, like we're doing with address points and parcel data. Um, you know, we've had requests um, for others for, you know, specific political boundaries and annexation boundaries and those, those kinds of things. Um, those are things we need to hear because what we do is, like we did with parcel data and address point data, you got to start somewhere. And we, we, we look around, we've already made some really good communications with the locals. It may be possible that we can ask them for that information as well. You know, moving forward, you you know, you don't know until you ask. So, um, you know, we're you know, with with uh, Clayton here, we're now going to start looking more into those kinds of uh, data sets that uh, maybe we're not necessarily thought that we could do. But if it could be done at a at a state level, it's something we want to definitely look into. So this is again why we need to hear from you guys. So thank you for for saying that. Um, any any other anybody else want to go? Any other things y'all are working on? Greg Smith Hart. Yeah, I guess I can I can say, say a couple of things. Uh, I'm Greg Smith Hart from the University of Texas Center for Space Research. Um, um, don't want to. I'm, I'm just going to focus on new stuff. Uh, I know we've got we've had a lot of old things, and ongoing things that that I've mentioned in the past, but. Um, one of the bullets is uh, we're working on optimizing uh, vir virtual environments for flood model. And we've seen about 20% increase in the performance of the model run uh, so far. And uh, we're also experimenting with uh, knowledge graph, ArcGIS knowledge graph. Um, so doing doing basically uh, it, for those that haven't used it, it's as we use uh, knowledge graph mapping solution. Um, and then we're also doing working a little bit with Survey 123, uh, the Survey 123 server, trying to do some disconnected editing. And uh, there's a a group up in Alaska, for instance, that we're working with scientists up there that are doing surveys, and they're in super remote places, places that don't even have roads going to them from, from what I've seen on the, on the maps. And it's part of the, um, the uh, what's it called, Navigating the, the New Arctic, which is a national science program, uh, or National Science Foundation program. And uh, so we're working a little bit with that and experimenting and seeing what, what we can do on that front. And uh, that's pretty much it. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Railroad. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jared Ware uh, from Railroad Commission in Texas. A uh, couple of things that we're working on right now. Uh, we've got a project on our uh, surface casing estimator. I have a contract with uh, Bureau of Economic Geology. So we can work in that application, which is a ESRI application, to be able to kind of serve out to do analysis on different locations for the, the depths for that. We're kind of looking at more of an kind of external facing versus internal facing. So we'll be working over on that over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, I, I've now moved from critical infrastructure. I mean, I'm working geothermal uh, carbon capture and hydrogen. So I've been working on the geothermal way that Senate Bill 768 transitioned it from TCQ to us for closed loop geothermal. So uh, in fact, I'll just over to Texas Water Development World with Robert Bradley talking about the data model that I met with, with Scott last week. So I'm trying to figure out how to you know, who's got what, we can put this together and then get it all in the, the database and serve that out and like set up. So one of the initiatives that, that um, I'm kind of working on right now. And then another one I've been working on. I was just, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, he's doing great work on that. And that's that's a, an important layer for us as well. And if that, if there's more interest uh, with other agencies, I mean, that might be a Absolutely. good candidate for another you know, state layer. Yeah, because yeah, the data, that's what I was talking to Rob about. It's the data model because the way we use it may be a little different. So I'm looking for ideas. It's a, it, it's open open book right now. So if you got any uh, rows or columns that you would like to see in that, we can implement that as well because I'm just building it internally. And then another one I'm working on um, is really kind of taking some, some reporting. So I've been working with uh, ArcGIS and Power BI. So I've automated it where we can take, fill out an MS form populates and then you've got everything instantaneously mapped and you can scroll in and get that. Our analysts have been looking for a way because everything's kind of email or it's stored in another folder. It's like just automated one person, one touch point goes out to 100 people. So that's one of the things that 
I've been messing around with some of the Power BI. And uh, finally, we actually do have two open positions for a, a GIS one or two that are on CAPS jobs right now. So we're looking at that. And a couple other jobs that have some engineering background. They may not say GIS, but uh, everybody in technical permitting uses GIS. So those GIS skills are, are valued at the Railroad Commission, particularly now. So. Jared, thank you so much. Appreciate that. We, we, we knew when we were having it here, we were hoping you, you would be here. So. <laughs> so glad you made it. Uh, all right. Any any um, other folks, Laura? I guess I'll say something. I was going to call on you. I was giving you some leeway. Um, I had a role change recently that some of you may be aware since I saw you last at the forum. Um, I am with Text Now. I'm the GIS Innovation and Training Lead, so helping develop statewide solutions. Um, if y'all are not aware, Text has 25 districts throughout the state. Each one of those districts functions as its own business of operations. So um, I work here at headquarters out of Stasny now, and our role is to um, really help develop and identify these solutions that can fit all the districts across the whole state. And then also trying to work with those districts and identifying, well, what kind of one-offs do you need, solutions do you need um, to maybe satisfy the other state and local government requests um, that are coming in that they need to provide that information out. And then I'm also leading the training. So um, we've got a lot of internal things going on right now that I'll hope to be able to share some more information at the next quarterly meeting. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. And congrats on your new position. Thank you. Uh, Any, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Miguel. Yes. Oh, I, I wanted to jump, to jump on the questions that I had. What I need to do was to vertically slice some data, some 3D data. And I tried with QGIS, I tried with RGS, I tried with several things. And I couldn't, and eventually I was able to do it with FME, making iterating blocks with your extent on about one feet high, making those blocks and then intersecting your data within those blocks to create features that they can be all put together. Therefore, you slide your data vertically like a cake. And FME was able to do it when nothing else that I tried to want. So thank you. Another plug for it. I'm not using it. Should be. <laughs> Anyone online? Anybody online? Yeah. So we have Chris Bardash. So Chris, I'm gonna allow your mic and camera. If you wanna hop on and give us an update. Can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, we can't hear him in here. I don't think. Oh, that kind of defeats the following purpose here. Okay, so people can hear online, but not in the room. We can put a mic on it. It's not that important. <laughs> One sec. Go into the this one. a lot of pressure i feel like i'm gonna to have to say something really special hello you just want the heat is on i like it Glenn Fry. All right, go ahead, Chris. Hello, can you hear me? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Hey, go, I'm ahead. Talking. go ahead, Chris. I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking and typing.
I put my camera on, you can see that I'm talking, but you can't hear me. So what, you can hear me? I'm getting thumbs up. Oh, what? Well, I can't hear you now. Okay, that's fine. I'll go ahead and talk. I really didn't have anything that important to say, but uh, now I feel like there's something really amazing. So uh, I just wanted to chime in a little bit on what the, the Longs said in their presentation about FME. We didn't really use FME until about four or five years ago. We hired somebody who has a lot of expertise in it, David Prosak. Uh, and since TechStock has some other people, uh, Trey Nunn as well, who are uh, real FME whizzes. And it's been a game changer for us. Project now. And so what's interesting is, I don't know, five years ago, I felt like it, it was good if I could get somebody out of college who had some Python experience. And nowadays that has grown and that, that has gotten better. And now we're kind of in the same uh, ballpark, in the same, in the same situation with FME. Uh, there are, you know, very proactive folks that have figured out how to use it or used it a little bit, but not seeing a lot of people coming out of college having had FME courses. So it's good that, to hear that ACC is teaching one, um, because as I say to all the people that interview for my program, you know, we're really relying more and more on technical expertise than a lot of the more manual stuff that you know, I started my career doing. So it's interesting to see, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. And speaking of careers, uh, I just closed the position myself, um, but I think there's another one opening up in our section in TPP. There's one advertised on our website right now. If you go to text.gov and click on the careers button, you can just type in GIS. Uh, but I think that one's closing soon too. But my point is just that Tech uh, GIS has really grown a lot at TechStot lately. I've been really excited to see that. And uh, we, it seems like we almost always have a GIS job advertised. So I think, you know, that's good news for us as TechStot. But really, the reason I share that is just because um, its profession is, is maturing and growing. Um, and to seems evident in, in the amount. You know, we've I've recently saw an, a report from HR on how many jobs we've had and the the level of GIS analyst, and uh, we're all increasing. And I think that's a good thing for our industry, and it's also a good thing just in in general. You know, we do a lot of important uh, underutilized, underrecognized work. I'll just mention a couple other things about what we're doing at TechStot, and then I'll be quiet. Um, we have a, a fairly new program, the Geographic Information Management Program. Um, Laura, who was just speaking, I believe, I couldn't see her, but um, is has joined over there. And um, they're doing an enterprise data integration project, which I think is a really big deal and a sign of you know, how GIS has matured at TechStot. So I'm excited to see where that program goes for us. And also more locally in, in uh, our group in this in my section, um, we're working on a, a, a statewide uh, imagery and LIDAR, street level imagery and LIDAR uh, acquisition. And I can't really say a whole lot about it. Um, at this point, I think they're scoring RFPs, but um, we're really excited to see where that takes us. We'll be able to use that to automate the extraction of a lot of data that we have to do manually. And of course, Texas is a big state. We have the biggest highway network as well. So that's a lot of work, but I'm also excited. I've talked with Richard about it in the past, but um, there could be a potential in the future for some kind of collaboration with that. I would think while it's mo most useful for us, it could be useful for some other people. So maybe a Texas imagery service type of collaboration. I don't know but just planting the seed, I would hope that we could do something like that. But anyways, that's the news from Lake Wobegon. Thanks for tuning in.
Chris, thank you so much. Um, just want to make sure everybody can still hear me online. Yeah, can you guys still hear okay. us online? Okay, thank you. All right. Chris, uh, uh, thank you for that. And um, yes, we're all, we, you know we're very interested in that, in this mobile light or stuff that y'all are working on. You know that we've been uh, we've been kind of uh, bending your ear for the last uh, year and a half on learning more about that. So the minute you could talk about it, we would love for you to yeah uh, you know uh, talk at at this uh, community meeting in detail. So we appreciate that. Um, yeah, and I do want to also sing the praises of ACC, not just because I'm on the advisory board. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I mean, uh, seriously, I think just the stuff that, you know, the quality of, of the folks coming out of there um, is amazing. And, and what I see being taught out of uh, ACC, I just don't think there's there's any, any better organization for, for GIS uh, uh, educational-wise. I think it's amazing. So um, reiterate what what you said so um anybody else online yeah if anybody else who's attending virtually if you just raise your hand if you want to participate and I'll, I'll unmute you anybody else oh we we got one we got colleen moldy I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Colleen. Okay. Can y'all hear me? We can hear you. Yay. All right. So I don't have a whole lot to contribute being a very, very, very early career um, GIS professional, but I just wondered if uh, y'all had any tips or pointers or things you wish you knew as a GIS baby? Uh, <laughs> any directional ideas for somebody who's just kind of starting? Colleen, I think you've already taken the first step by joining this meeting, for sure. <laughs> um, I mean, really, I, 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 and the fact that you've agreed to speak up, I think is a big deal. Um, everybody in this room, um, I believe, you, you said you don't have a lot to contribute. I would beg to differ because you'd be surprised how many people, you know, just coming into it teach us some really, really good things. Um, so the only recommendation I would make, and I'll let other people speak up, but is continue to come to these meetings, uh, reach out to myself, reach out to our team, reach out to the folks in this community, and just start having conversation because you'll be surprised. We're a small knit group, but we know everybody. And, uh, and we can put you, you know, if you've got a particular direction you want to head or you've got an interest, uh, somebody here can point you to that right person to talk to and about how to move forward. So uh, I believe you are already on your way to, to doing exactly that. So anybody else chime in? Yeah, come to the Texas GIS Forum in October. Absolutely. Oh, I did. It was wonderful. I really liked the keynote speaker. The ending keynote speaker was, was a fa amazing speaker. Yeah. Um, anybody have any other words of wisdom for Colleen? Continuously learn. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's, that's right. right. Continuously learn and do not uh, do not uh, think you know everything. Even when you're 35 years into it, like I am, I realize that uh, the you know the people coming in. Um, I just stay out of everybody's way. Now. That's just the role I've got. <laughs> Um, but really the bottom line is you will always learn. This is a technology that I feel like every five to seven years you're doing something different in your career uh, because your job changes so much. So uh, be, be comfortable with change. Yes, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. But I look forward to meeting you in person. Um, so hopefully at the next meeting. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Much appreciated. Great. Any other comments? I would say you're never too old to take classes at ACC. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, I am. That is where I'm doing my certification program. So I will probably see you <laughs> there. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on and being brave. Appreciate that. Thanks. Anybody else? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Courtney raised her hand.
All right, Courtney, I'm going to unmute you. All right, Courtney, it's all yours. All right. Well, hey, everybody, I'm Courtney Rowe and Colleen. Uh, don't forget, there's a lot of uh, geospatial groups out there that you can join. Just find one that aligns with what uh, your personal mission is, how you want to give back to the geospatial community. And um, if your mission's aligned, then any group is a good one to join. And speaking of, I will be heading out from home and over to the Schultz's Garden um, for the Swiggis Mappy Hour. So uh, supporting women in geography and GIS would love to have all of you join us over at Schultz's Garden across the street from where the meeting is. And I hope to see you there and start the new year off right. Absolutely. Supporting women in GIS with beer. <laughs> <laughs> Now, sounds great, Courtney. We look forward to seeing you shortly. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else in the room? And, 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 and Thomas Brown, just know that I, I'm trying to be really good about not saying too much about the project we're working on, but it, I can't really not talk about it. So, um, which was the, the school safety thing that I mentioned earlier. So Thomas Brown is, is kindly helping me with formulating a plan. So, anybody else? Nobody else, sir. And uh, yeah, so the driving instructions are extremely hard from here. <laughs> uh, just stay uh, wherever you're parked and just walk about 500 feet that way, and you will come up on Schultz's. Um, before I end it all, anybody from TextGeo have any last? Bit of wisdom words to say things i forgot to say i would like to yeah oh i'm sorry i would definitely like to thank you know mike and stephanie for your uh, amazing presentation um i uh fme to me is kind of the i'd like to say up and coming it's been up and coming for i don't know as long as i've been i could hear at text geo so um but uh, uh we know we hope that if we have questions or whatever we can kind of Get you up with a few things Absolutely. and i and appreciate those links we'll definitely publish those around so um so with that and if we could just give maybe one more round of applause for my and uh, then i think i have uh uh oh is this uh, laura do you want to this is your book okay. you can kind of do it if you want no no no, no. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to give you a few uh, last slides here. And so we are already thinking about uh, the 2024 Texas GIS Forum. And as such, we are open to themes and ideas from the community. And so we are submitting our own themes and ideas. Um, but if maybe it will be chosen for 2024 this year in October. I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a picture if you like. Um, this will be open until next Friday. So um, think on it, submit them next week, um, and I appreciate it. Next slide. It's going to be another QR code. Don't check your phone for you. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, so y'all have all made it here. That's wonderful. We send out invitations to these meetings quarterly through our email list. And so if you're not on that already, um, you can get on it by um, scanning this QR code or going to our website, going to the GIO page and scrolling down to the bottom and signing up there as well. Um, we send out invites to this meeting and any other events that we have or like really big news from TextGIO, um, as well as information about the forum in October. And so uh, these are the dates for those things. So our next meeting is going to be April 17th. Like I said, we have them quarterly. Um, I believe we are pretty sure about the location for that. It's going to be hosted in the domain at Amazon's offices in April. Um, so we hope you can attend in person there and check out those cool uh, new offices from them. And then uh, the forum will be October 21st through 25th this year, again, at the Pickle Center. Any questions? All right. 
Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, you folks online. Thank you very much. Sorry about a little bit of the technical issues, but I think it went really well. Hopefully, y'all could hear us. And we will see you next time. And hopefully, we'll see some of y'all across the street. So.